think we're about ready. We're about ready? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, Ape Men, Adam, and the Gospel. <clears throat> Have any of you ever seen that picture before? Yeah, the evolutionists love to use that to convince people of evolution, and it's been very effective. And uh, in 2017, Gallup poll did a survey of Americans' views on origins, and they found that 38% uh, hold to the biblical view, down from 47% in the past. Uh, another 38% hold to theistic evolution, which says that we did evolve from an ape-like creature, but God was mysteriously guiding the process uh, behind the scenes. And then 19%, uh, up from 9% in the past, hold to the atheist view, which says we did, even, did evolve from an ape-like creature, but God didn't have anything to do with it because there is no God. So uh, <clears throat> I was a math major in college, so I did the math on this, and I found that 57% uh, of Americans believe that we evolved from an ape-like creature. Well, we're going to look at that, and I want to begin by showing you a video. So if we're ready on that, Pastor, um, it's entitled, Who Do You Think You Really Are? It's a, a video clip from, um, uh, it's a trailer from a video that was shown in the Natural History Museum in London for a number of years, might still be shown, I don't know. But it features Sir David Attenborough, who is the famous voice of science for the BBC. And uh, so I want you to listen to what he has to say. I'm going to take you on a journey, a journey to discover who you really are and where you came from. But you're not just going to sit there listening to me, you're going to be part of the experience and you'll be able to examine some of the evidence for evolution along the way. If you have a look at your screens now, you can rotate the modern human skull and you'll see the domed forehead, the small face, the small front teeth and on the lower jaw chin. If you keep looking through your screen, you will see Australopithecus afarensis, an extinct hominid who lived about three million years ago. Deep sea anglers live at a depth in the ocean below a thousand meters where there's no light, so they're living in total darkness. It was our fishy ancestors that first developed some of our most fundamental features, our skeleton, jaws and four limbs. Hold up your screen and look through it one last time. You'll see the tree that represents all of life, past and present. We started this film with a question, who do you think you are? And we can end it with an answer. You are undoubtedly, like every other living thing on earth, a member one single family of life, descended from a common ancestor living thousands of millions of years ago. So there you have it. Your great, 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 great grandfather is a little tiny bacterium. That's fact. That is taught as scientific fact. That is why millions and millions of people believe in evolution. That is why children are led to believe in evolution. It's, it's powerful. When you see those images and you hear David, David Attenborough and he does his nature programs, it's, it's powerful. And in that video, you saw the evolution tree of life. It was produced by those blue laser beams in contrast to the creation forest of life. And so one of the branches on the evolutionary tree is the branch of hominid evolution. And the evolutionists believe that the orangutan, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, modern man, as well as Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Homo erectus, Homo ergoster, Australopithecines, they're all related to a common ancestor, an ape-like creature. Don't say that we're evolved from apes. The evolutionists will protest. They'll say, no, we're evolved 
from an ape-like creature, apes and humans are evolved from a common ancestor. But if you ask them to draw a picture of what that creature looked like, you'd say, well, that looks like an ape. In contrast, the creation forest of life, a creationist who've studied this think that um, the orangutan is, is probably one kind of an ape. Chimpanzees and gorillas may be related to a common ancestor along with the Australopithecines. But mankind would include Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Homo erectus, Homo ergoster. Those are all true humans descended from Adam and Eve just like you and I. So two different ways of looking at the origin of man. The evolution tree, the creation forest. And as we've already mentioned, and we'll keep emphasizing tomorrow night, everybody has the same data. They have the same fossil bones, skulls. They have the same DNA to study. They have the same living creatures to study. But they have a different starting point. They have a different set of assumptions, a different worldview that they're using to interpret the evidence. The evolutionist starts with a naturalistic worldview. We can explain the origin of man by time and chance and the laws of nature. The creationist starts with the assumption, this is the eyewitness testimony of the creator. And he says that he created man supernaturally, unique from all other creatures. And so we're going to look at this and see which view fits the facts. And I'm going to begin with uh, looking at what the evolutionists say, and then we'll look at what the Bible says. Uh, one of the key creatures leading to man in the evolutionary view is Australopithecus. Australo meaning southern, Pithecus meaning apes. So these are the southern apes. And uh, much of the evidence for Australopithecus has been found in East Africa, uh, particularly Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. And the most famous Australopithecine is Lucy. How many of you have ever heard of Lucy? Yeah, she's more famous than Eve today. And uh, Donald Johansson was a, a PhD student. He uh, and his team found the bones of Lucy in 1974. They didn't find them uh, laid out nice, neat, organized way like this, but they found about 25% of the skeleton. But because of the symmetry of the body, they could reconstruct about 75%. Uh, since that time, other Australopithecine fossils have been found. So they now have hand bones, feet bones, and uh, this is the way the Natural History Museum in London has represented Lucy. And I want you to notice that she has human hands, human feet, upright posture, but an ape-like face. There are even evolutionists who would say that that is a serious misrepresentation of the fossil evidence and that Lucy and her kind were knuckle walkers similar to a bonobo or pygmy chimp or gorilla. And so that's the way we've pictured here in our Creation Museum, as Dr. David Menton uh, on our staff, professor of human anatomy for 34 years, uh, worked with our artists as they looked at the actual fossil evidence. Well, that's Lucy in London, but now I want to show you Lucy in St. Louis, because the St. Louis Zoo had a Lucy exhibit for many years, and that's Lucy in St. Louis. Now, she's got more hair. But she still has human hands, human feet, upright posture, and an ape-like face. And look at that face. Do you see the whites of the eyes? Those are human eyes. Apes don't have eyes like that. Their eyes are almost completely black or dark brown. They have to really turn to the side for you to see any whites. Those are photographs of real apes. That's an imaginary creature created by an evolutionary artist. And just by putting human eyes into the art, it makes the creature look more human-like. Well, that's Lucy in London and Lucy in St. Louis, but the Chicago Field Museum also has a Lucy exhibit, and that's Lucy in Chicago. Now, she's a little bit more robust, but she still has human hands, human feet, upright posture, and an ape-like face. But her face is different from the other two. And then that's Lucy in a BBC television program in 2006, now, her face is completely different from the other three, although she does have that unusual hairline. But that's because the BBC is in London and the Natural History Museum is in London, so they've got to make those kind of, kind of match. But then that's Lucy in Smithsonian Magazine and Lucy in Science Magazine. It's just any way the artist wants to draw her. 
Richard Leakey is the director of the Kenya National Museums. He is the son of the famous Lewis and Mary Leakey, all atheist evolutionary anthropologists. In a book called The Making of Mankind, to teach the public where man came from, he said this in 1981. We can now say that Australopithecines definitely walked upright. So is there any doubt in his mind about this? No, they definitely walked upright. Well, that was 1981. But in 1982, he was up in London speaking at the Royal Institution, a very famous science institute. And there was a reporter from the New Scientist magazine that went to the lecture. Now, the New Scientist is a weekly science magazine published in Great Britain, and it summarizes the technical scientific literature for the general public so that we can kind of stay informed on what's going on in science. And it is evolutionist in orientation. The reporter tells us, Leakey points out that paleontologists do not know whether Australopithecus walked upright. Nobody has yet found an associated skeleton with a skull, he says. Well, now that's interesting. In 1981, he said, we definitely know they walked upright. Now he says, nobody knows whether they did. But I wonder how many people who read his book were at this prestigious lecture to hear that statement. The article goes on to quote Leakey. I'm staggered to believe that as little as a year ago, I made the statements that I made. Well, I'm staggered too. <laughs> so said Richard Leakey before the elegant audience of a Royal Institution evening discourse last Friday. He had come to reveal that the conventional wisdom which he had so recently espoused in his BBC television series, The Making of Mankind, was probably wrong in a number of crucial areas. You see, the BBC realized not enough people will read that book. So we've got to do a documentary so more people will know what's in that book. But now, Leakey says, he was probably wrong in a number of crucial areas not little, tiny, insignificant points. I wonder how many people who watched the documentary were at this prestigious lecture to hear that. In particular, he now sees man's oldest ancestor as being considerably younger than the 15 to 20 million years he plumped for on television. How many TV viewers ever heard that? Leakey says that the basis on which paleontologists classify fossil apes in humans is misleading. And he would like to see an entirely fresh episode of classifying. So it's a naming game. Change the names, change the evolutionary tree. Well, that was 1982. In 1986, uh, there was an article in Discover Magazine, a leading American science magazine. Pat Shipman is an evolutionary paleontologist. And he began the article this way. An extraordinary 2.5 million year old skull found in Kenya has overturned all previous notions of the course of early hominid evolution. We no longer know who gave rise to whom, perhaps not even how or when we came into being. Now, if I had a dollar for every time I have read in the scientific literature that some discovery has overturned all their previous thinking about some aspect of evolution, I'd be a millionaire. Because these, these kinds of statements regularly appear in the scientific literature. But they found this skull. Don't worry about the 2.5 million years. We'll, we'll point you to some resources that will show you that those dating methods are completely unreliable. But they found this skull, and now they don't know who gave rise to whom, when, or how we came into being. So here's a chart from Donald Johansson, who found Lucy and Timothy White, another leading American anthropologist. And uh, they have some questions before they get to Lucy's kind, but then they're very confident that some of Lucy's descendants went off into extinction. Other descendants eventually evolved into man. They have that all figured out, except they do have a question about Neanderthal. And then they found that skull. And now they don't know who gave rise to whom, when, or how we came into being. Well, that article in Discover Magazine went on to summarize all the evidence for Australopithecus up to 1986. And the article ended this way. The bottom line of all this is that a great deal of work needs to be done. It's a new era in paleoanthropology. The things we thought we understood reasonably well, we don't. 
No better argument can be made to support the time, trouble, and cost of field work than this new skull. Like an earthquake, the new skull has reduced our nicely organized constructs to a rubble of awkward, sharp-edged new hypotheses. That's a scientific word for guess. It's a sure sign of scientific progress. Well, it is progress. It's progress when you find out that what you thought was true is wrong. That is progress. But they're not getting any closer to the truth. They're getting more confused as time goes on, as I'm going to show you. Well, that was 1986. In 1994, uh, a series was presented on Nova Television on human origins. And I want to show you a clip from the first program. It features Dr. Owen Lovejoy, who is, uh, or at least was at the time, professor at Kent State University in Ohio. And the voice in the background narrating is Donald Johansson, who found Lucy. And I want you to watch and listen to what Dr. Lovejoy is doing to a plaster cast of Lucy's hip bones a plaster cast of her hip bones. So watch and listen. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. How did he know what that was? He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. How did he know what that was? It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. That's perfect. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Well, of course it does. He crowned it to look like ours. But now listen, if a creationist did that to the fossil evidence, or plaster cast to the fossil evidence, he'd be crucified. An evolutionist does it, this is good science. Now, this is not good science. This is a manipulation of the evidence to fit a preconceived idea. We saw those different representations of Lucy. Uh, she didn't look like any of those. That's what she looked like. Pretty close. She's not our relative. What about Neanderthal man? Well, the first Neanderthals were discovered in 1856 in the Neander Valley in Germany. And this is the way they were pictured. They were pretty robust, stooped in the shoulders, ape-like in the head, and not wearing very many clothes. Of course, the clothes are not preserved in the fossil record, so that's pure imagination. But they've uh, since found Neanderthals in various places in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. And there are now even evolutionists who would say that if you dressed up Neanderthal in a coat and tie and uh, put him in Charity Baptist Church, nobody would take a second look. In fact, Time Magazine, uh, 25 years ago, had an article, The Changing Faces of Neanderthal. And they showed how Neanderthals have been represented over the years. So here you have Harper's Weekly, 1873. He needs a haircut and a shave. Otherwise, he could be an American Olympic athlete. But then in 1909, he's ape-like in the head, but human otherwise and naked. In 1953, he's behaving like some human beings, but he's ape-like in the head. And then in 1984, um, he needs a shave and a haircut, taught not to eat live frogs or mice, whatever he's got there in his hand, but he's human. In 1988, he's showing that he needs to go to the dentist, but he's human. But then CNN has him more ape-like in 2006. He's got a lot more hair in 2007 in Newsweek. And he's perfectly human in Science Daily in 2008. Well, the Neanderthal Museum, uh, for many years, had uh, an exhibit where they featured the 1983 version and the 1909 version. And one evolutionist commenting on this said, 
From his bestial 19th century persona to just another guy in a suit, Neanderthals have been pigeonholed according to the times. Well, the Neanderthal Museum, uh, like all good museums, they upgraded their exhibits. And in 2010, this is what they looked like. Now, that guy on the left has been out in the sun a little bit too long. And he does have a pretty big nose. But I've noticed that some of you have big noses, and so I've been wondering, you know, where you are on the evolutionary tree. Now, those are, those are humans. There are people that look like that. Yes, but the Neanderthals were primitive. They had primitive stone tools, primitive culture. That shows that they weren't fully human. No, it doesn't. When George Washington was president of the United States, living in the presidential palace there in uh, Philadelphia, with Persian rugs on the floor, fine china and cutlery, and a toilet in the house, living right in the very same country at the very same time, were Native American Indians living in teepees with no Persian rugs on the floor, no fine china, no cutlery, and no toilet in the teepee, and they were just as human as George Washington. And we have people today that in our Western arrogance and pride, we call primitive, people like the Aborigines of Australia. They're different from us, they have a different lifestyle, but they're fully human. And they're Aborigine children that go off to Australian universities. And even though I have a PhD, if you drop me, by helicopter into the forest where they live with just the clothes on my body, I'd be dead in three days. I'd eat some poisonous plant. I wouldn't know how to make a boomerang or a spear. And even if I did, I wouldn't know how to catch anything. They're different from us, but they're not subhuman. Yes, but the Neanderthals lived in caves. That proves that they weren't fully human. No, it doesn't. In 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in caves on the, on the west side of the Dead Sea in Israel. Copies of the Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament, put in clay pots by a group of Jews who lived out there called the Essenes. They lived out there in the wilderness just before and after the time of Jesus. And did you know that the Bible speaks of cavemen? There are no ape men in the Bible, but there are cavemen in the Bible. Hebrews 11 speaks of men of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered about in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And Sarah, Jacob, Lazarus, and Jesus were buried in a cave, just like Neanderthals buried their dead in caves. And Lot, Elijah, and David lived in a cave for a while. Why did they live in a cave? Because the necessities of life required it. God said to Lot, get out of Sodom. I'm going to destroy the city. He went up into the mountains into a cave. Elijah was running from King Ahab. David was on the assassin's list of King Saul. And if you're running for your life, a cave is a really good place to hide. And we have cavemen today. A very famous one died a few years ago. His name was Osama bin Laden. And why was he living in the caves of the mountains of Afghanistan, we're told? Because the necessities of life required it. Really smart man. The archaeological evidence that Neanderthals were 100% human is overwhelming. They made sophisticated spears, needles, and stone tools. Now, an ape will use a stick to get ants out of an anthill. A bird will use a piece of straw to get a bug out of a tree. An otter will use a rock to break open an oyster on its stomach. But animals don't make tools. Only humans do that. They, made, uh, they used makeup and made seashell jewelry and painted art in caves. Only humans do that. They hunted dolphins and seals and dove for living sea mollusks. And only humans do that. They used fire to cook food. They made glue. They made, uh, maybe made ropes and nets. They built homes from animal skins. Now, beavers build dams. Ants build high-rise anthills. Birds build nests. But animals don't make homes from the skins of other animals. Only humans do that. They made flutes from bear femurs and headdresses from feathers. They cared for their sick and did surgery. Uh, we know they did surgery because we can see that bones were uh, healed. Uh, they recovered from some kind of operation. They ceremonially buried their dead. And uh, they made and sailed boats. And they possessed the hyoid bone and the voice box, which was almost identical to modern humans, according to 
evolutionists. They had the speech-associated gene FOXP2, and they interbred with modern humans. They had children with modern humans. In fact, DNA research has revealed that um, except for uh, black Africans, all other human beings have 1% to 3% Neanderthal DNA. So you're part Neanderthal. So am I. A few years ago, I was giving this lecture in California, and, and this guy, Dave, came up to me afterwards, and he said, uh, you need to use me in your lecture in the future. I said, why is that? He said, I've had my DNA tested. I'm 3% Neanderthal. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm from Lithuania. And uh, he wasn't primitive. He worked in technical support for Google, so I'm sure he was a lot smarter than me. <laughs> So Neanderthals are our relatives, and based on where we find their bones, we conclude that they are people who migrated from the Tower of Babel after uh, God's judgment. And as they moved into Europe and other places, there were no cities there. There were no factories. There were no homes. So you, you move there. A cave is a good place to take care of your family until you figure out how to mine ore and make axe heads and you're going to have very primitive culture initially after the dispersion from the Tower of Babel. Well, let's look at some more missing links. A uh, Piltdown Man was announced in 1912. Uh, the Illustrated London News had a picture of what he looked like based on the evidence, which was a piece of jaw, two molar teeth, a canine tooth, and a piece of skull. That's all the evidence they had. And the confident interpretation from the... Uh, Geological Society of London was that he was a half a million to a million years old. And they said the bones leave no possible doubt, but that they represent a man who must be regarded as affording us a link with our remote ancestor, the apes. No possible doubt. Well, the bones went into the Natural History Museum in London. There were scientists who said, you know, we would like to look at those bones. And the Natural History Museum said, we'd be happy to show you plaster casts of the bones. They didn't let anybody look at the actual bones for 40 years. Finally, in 1953, they let some scientists, they were actually evolutionists, look at the bones. And what they discovered, oh, I forgot to show you one other picture. Over the years, that was another representation of Neanderthal, more ape-like. But finally, in 1953, it was exposed as a deliberate hoax. The jawbone was from an orangutan that they estimated had died about 50 years earlier. The skull was human. They carbon dated it to be 500 to 700 years old. The bones were artificially colored with chemicals to make them look old. And when they examined the teeth under the microscope, they found file marks. The teeth had been filed to make them look human. It was a deliberate hoax. And the evidence pointed to some of the leading British scientists and at the British Museum involved. But... Um, by the time they found this, most of them were already dead. I think all of them were dead. But think about this. How many people who read the article in the newspaper about Piltdown Man in 1912 lived to 1953 to find out it was a hoax? And then there was Nebraska Man in 1922. And the Illustrated London News had a picture of what he and his wife were doing when they lost the only piece of evidence that was found which was a single tooth. And from that tooth, they reconstructed the whole scene. Well, they kept digging there in uh, Nebraska, and uh, by 1927, they had found more fossil evidence. And in a technical article, not in a popular newspaper, using a technical scientific name, not Nebraska man, they quietly announced, oops, we made a mistake. That wasn't an ape man. That was actually an extinct species of pig. So that's the real Nebraska man, and I like to say this is a case where a pig made a monkey out of a man. <laughs> Chris Stringer is a world expert on uh, the evolution of man from an evolutionary perspective. He's, at the, uh, he's a lead researcher in human origins at the Natural History Museum in London. In a book review of a book about human origins, he said this, the study of human origins seems to be a field in which each discovery raises the debate to a more sophisticated level of uncertainty. 
True to the traditions of the field, the arguments swirl around the questions of the correct classification of the fossils and of the presumed relationships between the species of humans and prehumans. So they're just getting to a more sophisticated level of uncertainty. Well, that was 1993. In 2000, National Geographic had an article behind the scenes. And I'm going to show you everything on this one page article. I couldn't believe they published it, but it's very educational. They had a picture of these six bones and a piece of jaw. And they said, it's hard to find someone who can draw a realistic looking early hominid. That's why the Geographics Art Department conducted a search for new talent. Four artists were picked to receive casts of two million year old female Homo habilis fossils from these bits of evidence. Now that's accurate, isn't it? That's bits of evidence. They were to sketch in skeletal and fleshed out form the hominid to whom the bones belong. So here's the assignment. We want you to look at those bones and we want you to draw a complete skeleton and then we want you to draw a picture of what the creature looked like when it had uh, muscles and skin and hair. Well, they go on. Each artist had two weeks with the bones before they were sent to the next persons. That's all you need to do this is two weeks. Research was completely up to the individual. That's why their work looks so different. There's no one way to draw her. Uh, that's significant. They conclude, paleoanthropologists reviewed the results. Intrigued with all four entries, the art department has invited the artist to paint finished versions based on input from the consultants. But I have another question. How will that help? <laughs> because the paleontologists don't have any more fossil evidence than the artists and they're not as good at art. So how's that gonna help? Would you be interested to see what they drew? Well, even if you're not, I'm gonna show you because this is very educational. Let's start with the head. All they have from the head is a piece of jaw. And remember, there's no one way to draw her. So let's see what they drew. Ape-like head, more human-like. Ape-like head, ape-like head but they're all different. And now we're gonna look at the rest of the body, but before we do, I need to remind you of two facts. The first fact is, they only had six bones, but there are 207 bones in the human body. So that's not much to work with. But notice something about those bones. They're bone fragments. So they're gonna to have to guess, well, how long was that bone when it was a complete bone? The second fact you need to remember is that Humans have, a, uh, have an arm to leg ratio of three quarters to one. So our hands come to the middle of our thighs. But apes have much longer arms. If they could stand up straight, their hands would come down to their knees or even farther. They all have the same six bones. None of them were complete bones. There's no one way to draw her. So let's see what they drew. Human length arms. Getting down to ape length arms. Human length arms with curved hands to kind of give it that tree dwelling look. And this one's in a tree. And those arms look pretty long. Folks, this is not science. This is art and imagination in one of our leading science magazines that is published all over the world in multiple languages. It's no wonder people believe in human evolution. The art is convincing them. Then in 2001, Daniel Lieberman, who's another leading evolutionary anthropologist at George Washington University, he made this statement, until a few years ago, the evolutionary history of our species was thought to be reasonably straightforward. Well, I would dispute that statement just on the evidence that I've presented already. But he goes on, lately confusion has been sown in the human evolutionary tree. The confusion now looks set to increase still further. They're getting more confused as time goes on. And look at his chart. Down the left side, you've got the millions of years. Then you've got those big, bold bars, blue, green, black, red. That's the fossil evidence. And then you've got the, uh, the, the thin lines with the question marks. That's not the fossil evidence. That's evolutionary imagination. So let's get rid of that so we can see the fossil evidence. That looks like different kinds of creatures have always been different kinds of creatures. Well, in 2006, an article appeared, Lucy's baby, 
an extraordinary new fossil. They showed us what they found. That's the stuff in orange. White is imagination. And they told us what they found. Shoulder blades and neck vertebrae like a gorilla. Inner ear canals like an African ape. A long curved finger like a tree dwelling ape. But now look at the picture. All they have from the arms is that one finger and a little bit of the upper arm bone. The rest is imagination. But they've drawn the arms the length of a human arm. It had a voice box like a chimpanzee's, cranial capacity like a chimpanzee's. So all the evidence is ape. But look at the way they drew it. It looks like he's standing upright, his ankles just like ours, a little boxy in the chest, but looks like he's part ape, part human. Well, I didn't give you the whole title of the article. It didn't say Lucy's baby, an extraordinary new fossil. It said an extraordinary new human fossil. But all the evidence is ape. So they should have said a new ape fossil. But if they'd said that, there'd be no reason to publish the article. Because who cares about an ape fossil? So what is this? It's more ape man deception in one of our leading science magazines, Scientific American. Well, we've seen there's various ways to make an ape man. You can take a few human bones, add imagination, and make an ape man. Or you can take a few ape bones. Or you don't even need an ape bone. You can use a pig tooth if you want. Add imagination and make an ape man. And then you can take a few ape bones and a few human bones and combine them together and add imagination and make an ape man. And if all those methods fail, you can always get an electric grinder or file and change the shape of some of the bones. Add imagination and make an ape man. But there never have been any ape men. Neanderthals were fully human. Piltdown man was a hoax. Nebraska man was a pig. Australopithecines are apes. And we could talk about Peking man, Java man, Ida, uh, Homo naledi. They're either fully apes, fully humans, or imaginary creatures. And in the book that we have back on the back table, which I edited and contributed to with uh, 15 other uh, scholars, scientists, and theologians, David Menton uh, and Marvin Lubenauer are ex experts on the fossil evidence. Powerful, powerful chapters showing uh, there is no fossil evidence that man evolved from apes. Well, what about the DNA evidence? You've maybe heard this that appeared in National Geographic. Picture of an ape on one page and the baby on the other. And they said in uh, bold big letters, the DNA profiles of these two are nearly 99% the same. Anybody ever heard that? Well, it's absolutely false. When they made that, that statement was made on the basis not of comparing the whole chimpanzee genome and the whole human genome, but only parts of the genome, and they used the human genome as a template. Uh, we have an article on our website, a technical article, by uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, who's a PhD geneticist, a scientist at the Institute for Creation Research in Texas. Uh, he taught at Clemson University for a number of years. And he has uh, obtained, uh, it's public information, the, uh, the genome of the chimpanzee and the genome of a uh, human, and done a very thorough analysis and concluded that uh, their genomes reveal an average similarity of 85% or less. And that fits what any five-year-old would recognize if he went to the zoo. He'd see that chimpanzee. You know, he's got five fingers, five toes. He, uh, he eats bananas. He peels them the same way we do. Uh, they, they peel it from the bottom. We peel it from the top. But he, he, would, he would recognize there's a reason why he's in the cage and I'm not. There's similarities, but there's vast differences. We have two more, uh, another chapter in Searching for Adam by uh, Jeffrey Tompkins and Nathaniel Jeanson of AIG on the genetics. And they argue not only does the genetic evidence prove that we uh, came from two individuals, but that the biblical time scale of only about 6,000 years fits the genetic evidence. The mutation, the, the rate of mutations in the human genome fits 
a 6,000 year old humanity. It doesn't fit the evolutionary view of 200,000, 300,000 uh, years of evolution of man. So there is no evidence that man evolved that stands up to scrutiny. Rather, imagination and art are the keys, and over time, the evolutionists are getting more confused. So what does the Bible have to say? Well, we need to look carefully at this because there are books coming from evangelical publishers that say that Adam was a myth. These two books published in 2019 and 2016, excuse me, 17 and 16, they both profess to believe the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. But they believe Adam was a myth. And the leading promoter of theistic evolution is BioLogos, started by Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, and appointed by President Obama to be the head of the National Institute of Health, and he is still the head of the National Institutes of Health. He's a theistic evolutionist, but he claims to be an evangelical Christian. And they are producing books and Sunday school curriculum, and they're trying to influence seminaries to accept evolution and to believe that we evolved from an ape-like creature as God pre-programmed the whole universe in the Big Bang to eventually do that, or God mysteriously behind the scenes, undetectably guiding the process. But the Bible says that Adam and Eve were created supernaturally and were unique from all other creatures. And I want to show you the biblical evidence for that statement. In Genesis chapter 1, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he crea created he them. And man is the only creature made in the image of God. Both male and female made in the image of God. It doesn't matter how old we are how smart we are, how healthy we are, whether we're in the womb or outside the womb, we're all made in the image of God. And then we go to chapter 2, and God gives us more detail about the creation of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 2, 7, we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Those words, living soul, are translation of two Hebrew words, nephesh, Chaya. Nefesh is, trans, is, a transla is translated in our English Bibles by soul or creature uh, or being. And uh, Chaya is the adjective form of the Hebrew verb to live. So living creature. And uh, in the KJV, um, those same Hebrew words are translated as living creature in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 9. So in Genesis 1, when God created the sea creatures and the birds on day 5, uh, the creature that hath life is a translation of nefesh chaya, so is living creature. Then on day 6, God refers to the land animals as living creatures. And Genesis 2, when God brought the animals for, Noah, for Adam to name, they're called living creatures, nefesh chaya. And then in chapter 9, when the animals come off the ark with uh, Noah, they are called nefesh chaya, living creatures. So the Bible says that not only man, but land animals, sea creatures, and birds are living creatures. Now those others are not made in the image of God, but the Bible calls them living creatures. So notice what Genesis says. Genesis 2.7 is critically important. God made man, it says, from the dust, from the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that became a living soul or a living creature. Nefesh chaya. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians. The first man became or was made a living soul. Now contrast that with what theistic evolutionists say. They say that God took a living creature, that it evolved a body like God wanted for man. He breathed into that creature the breath of life, and that became man. But that is exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. In English, or Hebrew, or Spanish, or Russian, or Arabic, or Japanese. The Bible does not say that God took a pre-existing -li pre living creature and transformed him into man. God made man and made him a living creature. So theistic evolution is absolutely impossible if we believe Genesis 2-7.
And you don't have to know Hebrew to know that. Just know that the same Hebrew words, living soul, are translated in the Bible in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 9, and elsewhere as living creature. So that's wrong. But we have more evidence that it's wrong. Because in Genesis 3.19, God said to Adam, uh, in judgment, in, sweat, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, and for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so Adam was made literally from dust, and we're all literally going to dust. So when you die, when I die, if, if, if they cremate you, you'll go to dust real fast. But if they put you in the coffin and put you in the ground, I want to tell you what's going to happen so you're not alarmed. You know, after a few million years, you're going to change into an ape-like creature. <laughs> and after a few more million years, you're going to change into a reptile. And then eventually, you'll change into an amphibian, eventually into a fish, and eventually into a little tiny bacteria, and then you'll turn into dust. N no, that's not going to happen. When you die, when I die, we're going directly to dust. And we're not passing through any animal stage. Well, God, gave, God made Adam, and he made a garden, and he put Adam in the garden, and he gave him an assignment to uh, name the animals. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found any uh, 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 help meet for him. And so in the process of naming the animals, Adam realized he was alone, that there were no other human beings for him to relate to. And so God put him to sleep. And uh, he took the rib, which he had taken from the man, and he made him into a woman, made that, that uh, rib into a woman, and brought her unto the man. Now in this case, Eve was made from a pre-existing living creature, Adam. But there is no way you can harmonize this verse with evolution. This is describing supernatural surgery. Genesis 3 says, Eve is the mother of all the living. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Adam was the first man. So the Bible is perfectly crystal clear. God made the first two human beings supernaturally. He created each of them in a different way supernaturally. And they are the parents of the whole human race. There were no other humans before them. There were no pre-Adamite race. They didn't evolve from some ape-like creature. They were supernaturally created and we're all descendant from them. And then in Genesis 5 and 11, we have those genealogies. You know those parts of the Bible that God put in there so that when you're, you can't get to sleep, you can read those, that so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so and you'll gradually fall asleep. No, there's some really important things we learn there. Those genealogies are giving us history. And those two genealogies in Genesis are unique in the Bible and unique in all of ancient Near Eastern literature because they are the only genealogies that have chronological information. They have time. So-and-so lived this many years and the next man was born and then he lived this many years and he died. Luke gives us a genealogy of Jesus from Jesus all the way back to Adam. There's no, no time information in that. Matthew gives a genealogy back to Abraham. There's no time information. None of the other genealogies in the Bible have time information. But in Genesis 5 and 11, there's time information. You know, I get the idea that God wants us to know how long ago Adam was. Because he gave us time information. And so... We can total up those years from, uh, Noah, from Adam to Noah, is Genesis 5, from Shem, who was on the boat with Noah, until Abraham, that's Genesis 11. And then there's several verses in the Old and New Testament that pinpoint Abraham at about 2000 BC, and it's about 2000 years from Adam to, uh, to Noah, uh, excuse me, to Abraham. And so we're 2000 years after Jesus, so Adam was created on the sixth day about six, a little more than 6,000 years ago. And I wrote the chapter in Searching for Adam, uh, giving the biblical arguments that Adam was created a little over 6,000 years ago. But as I said, um, the chapter on genetics says, um, by two geneticists, 
They argue that the genetic evidence confirms the biblical chronology. It does not fit the evolutionary story. Well, if we're all descended from Adam, then how do we explain where all the races came from? Well, the Bible's very clear. There's only one race. Acts 17 says, God that made the world and all things therein and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the, of the earth. So the Bible is very clear. It's always taught there's only one race, Adam's race. So the next time you fill out a census for the United States government, put other, Adam's race. And you'll give some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. Uh, real fits. So how do we explain that diversity of shades of brown skin color? Well, it's the result of the Tower of Babel. As God divided the genetic information, divided the gene pool, just in the same way that uh, animal breeders will divide the gene pool to produce distinctive characteristics in different varieties of dogs. Well, the Bible's always taught that. In 2000, the Human Genome Project finished uh, mapping the human genome, and they made a unanimous announcement. It's a biological fact. There's only one race. Scientists finally caught up with what the Bible said. But evolution theory is inherently racist. And Charles Darwin was racist. He was not in favor of slavery, but he was racist. And he said this, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, the apes that kind of look more like man, will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between a man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, than even the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now, between the Negro or Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. That's a racist statement. And you know, uh, people are pulling down statues in America of people who were racist. They ought to be pulling down every statue of Charles Darwin and removing every book he wrote because he was racist. Stephen Jay Gould, who I quoted in the last lecture, evolutionist at Harvard, he said, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. And even the evolutionary diagrams are inherently racist. Here's Time Life books. You go from an ape, a monkey, to a man, the skin gets lighter, and the last one is a Caucasian. Here's one in National Geographic. Here's one in Discovery Channel. These are inherently racist diagrams. But the Bible says there's only one race. So we have to, we have to fight against um, language that is confusing this issue. We talk about colored people, people of color. Well, I ask the question, which of those people are colored? They're all colored. There is no such thing as a white person. That lady back there has a white sweater on. If you find a white person, call 911. They're in real big trouble. <laughs> there are no white people. I am not white. I'm light brown. And uh, we, have, we have two uh, adopted grandsons from Kenya. They're not black. They're dark brown. Here you've got a lot of different people of shades of brown. Which one is the black person? I submit to you there's not a black person there. There's some really dark brown people, but there's some light brown people too. And what constitutes a black person? Is it the flared nostrils? Well, if you look at this picture, some of them don't have flared nostrils. Is it big lips? Well, some of them don't have big lips. So what is a black person? Scientists have discovered that researchers have found that 15 different genes make major contributions to skin color. We all have the same skin color. It's melanin is the primary pigment. We all have it. It's just some of us have DNA information that says make lots of melanin and we're very dark brown. And some of us have DNA information that says, just make a little bit of melon, and they're very light brown. And then there's all kinds of, of shades of brown in between. 
Uh, we can illustrate it this way, just talking about two genes uh, and uh, coming in two forms, two alleles, to uh, illustrate the point. Let's say you have big A and big e, B for lots of melanin and little a and little b for little amount of melanin. Those are combined together in different ways in the redu reproductive process from the, the sperm and the egg from the mom and the dad. So you could have one of the children would have big A, big A, big B, big B, and they'd be very dark skinned. One of the children might have big A, little a, big B, little b. They'd be kind of medium brown. Others, little a, little a, little b, little b, they'd be very light brown. So what color were Adam and Eve when God created them? Well, if they, were, if, if they all had little a, little b, they would be light skinned and all of their children would be light skinned. But if they were big A, big B, uh, all of their children would be dark skinned. So we think uh, that there's, there's no genetic variation in those two scenarios. So we think that uh, Adam and Eve were middle brown, that God gave them the genetic information for a whole kaleidoscope of color and uh, they could very well have had that kaleidoscope in one generation because Jewish tradition said they had 53 kids. And you might say, well, now that's impossible. Well, look at this family. The mother's from Ghana. The husband is from uh, Germany. They had twins, and they're not the same color. No, they are the same color. One of them just has a little more color than the other. Or look at this family. One of the twins is darker than mom and dad. The other twin is lighter than mom and dad. What's going on here? Well, both mom and dad have a black father and a white mother. And those two little girls have grown up and they love each other. And I ask the question, are they black and white twins? No, they're dark brown and light brown twins. So we have these human classifications, mongoloid, negroid, Caucasian, Cro-Magnon, Homo erectus, Neanderthal. Those are man-made labels for slight differences in physical appearance. But they're all descended from Noah and his family who descended from Adam and Eve. So when we really look carefully at the evidence, the evolutionary tree doesn't fit the facts. It doesn't stand up to careful scrutiny, biblical and scientific scrutiny. Well, so what? Does it really matter? Yes, it does. A few years ago, the London Zoo opened an exhibit in the summer they had people dressed in swimming costumes with fig leaves tied onto their swimming suits. And they were in a cage next to an ape cage. And uh, this was on YouTube the last time I looked in uh, 2018. And they were having a lot of fun. They were pretending like they were picking bugs out of the one guy's hair like apes do. And a spokesperson for the zoo said this, seeing people in a different environment among other animals teaches members of the public that the human is just another primate. Well, think about that. You have thousands of parents and kids going by this exhibit. They're laughing, and the message they're supposed to get is humans are just another primate. Well, we put primates in zoos all their lives. So is it okay to put a human in a zoo? That actually happened. Oda Benga was a pygmy African from the Belgian Congo. His first wife and kids were brutally murdered by white thugs from the Belgian government. His second wife died of poisonous snake bite. His tribe was captured by another black African tribe. He was sold into slavery. Eventually, he was sold to a white American explorer who was an evolutionist who brought him to the United States, showed him off at the St. Louis Zoo, at the, at the St. Louis World's Fair, and eventually took him to New York City where he sold him to the Bronx Zoo where he was placed in the orangutan cage to live 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Black pastors immediately protested. They eventually let him out during the day, but he had to sleep, sleep with the apes at night. Eventually, after a couple months, they let him out. He was taken into the care of some Christians. He was led to faith in Christ. He was working in a factory in Virginia when it was all too much for him, and he committed suicide. But what's wrong with that? if humans are just another primate. It's wrong because we're not just another primate. We're made in the image of God. So if Adam is in your past, 
That means that God is authority. He makes the rules. But if an ape is in your past, then morality is relative, and man can make his own rules. The atheists understand the implications. The American atheists a few Christmases ago posted this on their website. No Adam and Eve means no need for a savior. It also means that the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unamb uh, unambiguous literal truth. It is completely unreliable because it all begins with a myth and builds on that as a basis. No fall of man means no need for atonement and no need for redeemer. If evolution is true, that is perfectly logical thinking. But evolution is not true. It's a lie. It's a myth. And the scriptures are true. And the gospel is true. You see, the Bible presents Adam and Eve as historical people who really did something in time-space history. The Bible also presents the birth of Jesus as a historical event of a woman who was a virgin who conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible also presents the empty tomb of Jesus as a historical event. If we reject Adam and Eve because the scientific establishment says that's mythology, we, we evolve from an ape-like creature, then to be consistent, we need to reject the virgin birth and the resurrection. Because the same scientific community that says that Adam is a myth also says virgins don't have babies and dead men don't rise from the dead. But all of that is true, true history. Well, Bernard Wood is another um, evolutionist expert on human origins. He said this, uh, there's a popular image of human evolution that you'll find all over the place. On the left of the picture, there's an ape. On the right, a man. Between the two is a succession of figures that become ever more like humans. Our progress from ape to human looks so smooth, so tidy. It's such a beguiling image that even the experts are loath to let it go. Why won't they let it go? Because that picture is very effective in brainwashing people. But, this evolutionist says, it is an illusion. That, my friends, is an illusion. It's worse than an illusion. It's a deception because it leads people to think that they're just an animal descended from some other animal as a result of a long series of accidents in a purposeless universe and that there is no God to whom they are morally accountable. It's a deception. It's a lie because there is a God to whom we are morally accountable. There is a judgment day coming and we each will stand before our judge and our only hope on that day is if we have personally uh, repented of our sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that everyone in this room has done that. And if you're watching on, on the internet, I hope that you have done that. And if not, you need to think carefully about what you have heard. Well, in our answers book, in the first one, there's a chapter on racism. In the second one, there's a chapter on ape men. Also in the first two answers DVDs, five to seven minute answers on that question. We have a book, A is for Adam, for the preschool kids. This lecture is available, and Searching for Adam is an in-depth, biblical, theological, historical, genetic, paleontological, anatomical, uh, ethical defense of a literal Adam and a literal fall, because Adam is under attack today. And uh, we've got a great book on one race, one blood, for adults and teenagers, and uh, a similar book for the younger kids and a little booklet on racism. If everybody in America understood and believed what the Bible says about the origin of man and origin of people groups, we wouldn't have a race problem. We don't have a skin problem. We have a sin problem. And uh, it's a problem in the church. It's a problem in the culture. So encourage you to take some of those resources and share them with others. You may be here tonight and you say, you know, this is wonderful. I believe all this. I don't have any problem with this. But I would encourage you to think about your children, your grandchildren, your lost neighbors and, and relatives. They probably don't believe this. And get them a, a DVD. Get them a booklet. Get them something to get them thinking about. You can give it to them and say, hey, would you watch this? Would you read this? And let's get together for coffee sometime and talk about it. 
a way to open the door for evangelism. So I encourage you to take advantage of those resources. Well, tomorrow night, we're going to look at uh, where this millions of years idea came from historically and how the church compromised with that idea and why and what the consequences of that have been in the church. So I'd encourage you to come back. This, that lecture is based on my own PhD research. And then in the last session, we'll look at the Big Bang um, exploding the myth. And uh, if you understood what I talked about tonight, you'll understand that, because I'm not going to get into physics and equations, and I'm going to quote evolutionists themselves, astrophysicists, and show you the Big Bang is a myth. They don't know how the universe came into existence. And I'm going to show you that the Bible clearly rules out the Big Bang. There's no way to harmonize that idea. And millions and millions of Christians have bought into the Big Bang because they're not paying careful attention to what the scriptures say. And they've just swallowed what the scientific establishment says. So, And then in the morning sessions with the kids, you're welcome to come to those if you're free. Um, I, I, I guarantee that you will be able to understand them because those are for younger kids. And I found that adults seem to be able to pick up on it. So, okay.